tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then, I've got just the thing. Get comfortable, settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 9, Episode 24, the final episode of this season. I'm your host, Otis Jiry, and in this episode, I'm going to be bringing you a nice warm cup of Christmas creeps. Just like Halloween this year, I've received a few festive items to decorate the homestead here, all courtesy of a tale of woe. We've got four of them to share with you tonight, ranging from stories of woeful ships at sea, EMTs with personal demons, visions of not-quite-sugar plums after a crack on the head, to a very special gift-giving. And also, to brighten your spirits just a little bit, I'll be doing a reading of something not quite so scary, an annual tribute, if you will, as an interlude for the evening. This, however, is our standard program, which contains two of the above tales as well as the poem. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail so, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> This episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by BetterHelp. Well, this is it, friends, the last Otis Jerry check-in before Christmas. I wanted to ask you, how you doing? Winter holidays, Christmas especially, can be a very tricky time of year. It's a known but undiscussed fact that Christmas time is, in fact, some people's least favorite time of year, whether it be due to bad memories, finances, trauma, or even seasonal affective disorder. I'm here to tell you that it's okay. It's perfectly fine to feel exactly how you want to or need to feel. That's where BetterHelp comes in. BetterHelp is there to take care of your mental health when you feel like you need a little tune-up and everyone else has Christmas carols coming out of their, well, you know. You don't have to worry about anyone calling you a sad sack Samuel with this company. Within just 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with a therapist who specializes in your unique difficulties. You can text anytime and schedule calls or Zoom meetings weekly. With BetterHelp, help is never more than a text away. It's a professional counseling in your pocket, quick, convenient, and inexpensive. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash horror. Join over 1 million people 
taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash horror, H-O-R-R-O-R. Before we settle down officially, I think it's important we have ourselves a little drink. Eggnog, of course, is that most festive of holiday drinks, except for maybe the rum we add to it. <laughs> the term itself seems to be an American invention, which, to be fair, might be a little easier to stomach than the original milk punch, but that just might be my own thoughts about it. Some people love the stuff, some don't. But this particular eggnog, prepared especially from N.M. Brown Farms, has a bit of a sordid history, involving one fellow who grew up hating the stuff, and just one day decided it uh, would hate him back. Granted, he did get something out of it, but it might not be all it's cracked up to be. Without further ado, I present to you Blood and Eggnog. Eggnog, the Guinness of Dairy Products. There are two types of people, those that hate it and those that love it. I was born on December 22nd, just three days before Christmas Day. I can remember my mother talking about how she drank it by the half gallon the entire last trimester of her pregnancy with me. You can imagine all the weight she put on, not that my father ever said anything. He loved her unequivocally. Yes, that's the one thing I was always able to say about my parents. They'd been in love for my entire life, and well, before then. Anyway, where, where was I? Oh, right, eggnog. The combination of egg, milk, vanilla, cream, and spices that some people go crazy about. As mentioned earlier, I was exposed to it early on and haven't had a like for it since. I can't stand the stuff, if I'm candid about it. Never been much of a milk drinker. You probably think that this little tale of mine has something to do with ingesting it, right? Maybe a holiday version of occult poisoning or eggnog that turns citizens into mindless zombies on the hunt for flesh. Well, you'd be wrong. We aren't pulling a Jim Jones here. Here's what happened. It was a little over a week before Christmas, and my dog Buckley was, he was driving me crazy. I'd just gotten home from working the second shift and was desperately trying and failing to settle and unwind for the night. I'd worked four straight days at that point with another four to go before an actual day off. I'm not bitching or anything. The holidays are a busy time. I understand that. The damn dog wouldn't stop scratching at his bowl and whining at me. I'd been so busy with work that I'd completely forgotten to buy him food for the third day in a row. Well, I was beyond exhausted, and all the Instacart stores were closed down for the night. As much as I hated to go out, it wasn't Buck's fault that I was a forgetful asshole. So I threw on my coat, headed out the door, and got into my car. My annoyance increased as my frigid fingers fumbled with the buttons to control the radio stations. Every goddamn year, every station piled it on thicker and thicker the day after Thanksgiving. But of course, the one year I actually felt like hearing it, there was none. <laughs> Figures. I thought to myself, bitterly. I was pleased to see a mostly empty parking lot when I pulled into a 24-hour superstore. My contentment was short-lived, for I soon remembered that only the weirdos and drug addicts shop this late at night. Those not living in the parking lot in their vehicles, that is. I just needed to go in, get some dog food, and get out. As long as I stuck to the plan, I didn't see how things could become a problem. That's what I got for thinking. So, there I was, minding my business, trying to locate the pet food aisle, narrowly avoiding the stocking clerks. They recently remodeled, and due to the wonders of online ordering, I hadn't gotten a chance to stop in until that night. 
I can remember always getting pissed off when they'd be in my way stalking during the daytime. But now that they stalked overnight, I still face the same problem. I guess that's what my ex-wife said is true. There's just no pleasing some people. Their new cream-colored towel made the spill almost impossible to see, especially with it being so shiny from recent waxing. I hadn't been using a shopping cart. In my mind, that was the trick to overspending. If you say you're only coming in for one thing, you certainly don't need a card. However, it could have made all the difference in the world in this case. The sole of my left shoe swiftly flipped out from under me, and my arms whirled as they struggled for something to hold on to. An entire dairy section flew in front of my eyes as I fell to the floor. I saw the overhead fluorescent lights and heard a crack followed by a brief moment of pain and nothing only darkness. My head radiated with a white, hot heat before I even opened my eyes. The pain was only made worse when the first thing I saw was the blinding white lights above my face. Everything around me was white. The walls, curtains, tables, and chairs. I would have thought I'd died if an exasperated nurse hadn't come into the room. I'd been taken to a nearby hospital. Damn it! ambulance bill is going to be incredible, and they hold that crap against you now. It didn't used to be that way. An emergency used to be treated as such. After recuperating from a heart attack, the last thing you need is to come home and have a mandatory hospital bill send you right into a damn another one. Hundreds of thousands of dollars for slipping an eggnog. According to her badge, Nurse Linda said that I'd had a bad fall and had cracked my head open. A stocking clerk found me unconscious in a pool of my own blood. It probably scared the bejesus out of him. Head wounds are like that, though. The skin is so damn thin. One little cut and it looks like you're bleeding out. Still, my head did hurt like hell and I certainly didn't feel right. Her lips continued to move, but I couldn't focus on listening for my life. I mean, I'm sure she was giving me essential aftercare instructions, or at least was explaining how severe my head wound was. At that moment, though, I didn't care. Her body had become enshrouded in an orange glow, almost like a candle's flame. It was like daylight, pure sunshine seeping out of her fingers, face, and toes. It held a warmth to it, a comfort almost. I'd never experienced anything like it in all my life. It was brought up awkwardly in passing, and she said that it was entirely normal for some patients to have vision changes for a little while. My neighbor was kind enough to pick me up and take me to my car. I still hadn't gotten any damn dog food, but at least there was a less traumatic store to pick up some on the way home. Daylight savings time was still an issue after almost two months of it, so by the time he dropped me off, it was almost dark outside. Still, I couldn't help but notice that his shadow stayed close to his body, even under the parking lot's lights. Where the nurse held a light orange hue, my neighbor Philip only had black. Well, I wasn't going to look a gift horse in the mouth, and after all, I knew my head was just healing. Well, an entire week had gone by. Buckley was fed good and proper several times without complaint or delay, and people's colors still weren't fading. Not only that, but I was getting more familiar with what each of them meant. It felt like a mix between a Cocomelon Colors episode and Anthony Michael Hall from The Dead Zone. It would have been different if I could do something useful with it. The only thing this did was help me to tell me what type of person they were at the core on the inside. And honestly, at my age, I'd been around the block enough times to be able to assess the kind of thing of my own. Without the help of this new skill, I don't know what the hell to call it. No, I can't tell you what the winning lotto numbers are, and I don't know when or how you'll die. It's nothing like that. It could have been the onset of cataracts, for Christ's sakes, but it hadn't let me down yet. Still, I always found it fascinating when finding color in someone I hadn't seen before. It was like a mystery that was left for me only to unfold. 
Unfortunately, new colors didn't always bring positive connotations or tones. Despite my silent journey into the Roy G. Biv of the human soul, other things in town took precedence over my newfound ability. I awoke early the Sunday morning before Christmas to police sirens. It seemed the entire neighborhood one block over was going through one hell of a time. I hastily threw on my bathrobe and slippers as I went outside to inspect the situation, and I wasn't the only one. Half the neighborhood stood outside, bleary-eyed and just as confused as I was. However, someone was missing. I scanned the crowd for a good two or three minutes before realizing who it was. Philip, that son of a bitch can sleep through anything, I thought wryly. My thoughts were interrupted by a woman named Tammy who lived on the corner of our street. Tears made shining trails down her face, exaggerating the already smudged eye makeup from the night before. So what the hell was she so upset about? Well, I pondered, she didn't have a significant other or any kids that I was aware of, and I didn't smell a lick of smoke in the air that wasn't coming through the filter of a cigarette. My curiosity wasn't held in suspense for long. Finn and Moira McKenzie were a sweet couple who lived the next block over. I hadn't many interactions with them, but they'd always go door to door around the neighborhood caroling at Christmas time. The little girl would always give kind reminders to everyone to remember their secret Santa gift this year because no one deserved empty arms on Christmas. The young parents had woken up to discover their sweet little girl gone from her bed. Condensation from melted snow flurries settled over her pink dresser and her twin-sized princess bed frame. The window had been opened sometime in the night. Whoever the intruder was neglected to close it upon his retreat their retreat, I should say. It's not really fair of me to assume it was a man, I guess. Now, is it? There have been just as many lady kidnappers as men, if not more. Those new colors I mentioned earlier? That morning I discovered gray, and it wasn't just from the clouds outside. The parents were outside, speaking with police, attempting to, anyway. Moira was crying so hard that she couldn't say much of anything. I've never seen sadness or grief materialize like that before. The entire town was heartbroken over the news of a missing child, especially so close to such a beloved holiday. They say the first 48 hours of any missing person's cases were crucial. It had been close to 72 at this point. Even with no children of my own, I was still just as shocked as everyone else was that such an awful thing had happened so close to home. Everyone says that crimes in her town are such surprises because nothing bad ever happened there. And in our case, at least, it was true. Her colors were visible even through her photograph, vibrant swirls of pink and yellow. A heart ache for her parents, enrobed in swaths of gray and blue. What's worse is the day was finally upon us. The Christmas Eve sun had risen high in the sky and was on its way down for the night. Families had done their best to hold traditional celebrations at home, trying hard not to think of the Mackenzies and their little girl Rhonda. There would surely be a pile of gifts laying cold and lonely under the Christmas tree, waiting patiently to be opened by a child who wouldn't be there to open them Christmas morning. We'd all been interviewed time and time again. No one had seen anything pertinent to the disappearance of the case. It was terrifying. After all, little girls don't just vanish into thin air, except it seemed that this one did. Our neighborhood had a little Christmas tradition, a secret Santa type deal, if you could call it that. Something like that obviously didn't seem appropriate this year. Safely, I'd already gotten Philip a gift. It seemed fitting to perform an act of goodwill with the neighborhood being in such a somber tone. Something in the pit of my gut made me hesitate. I found myself coming up with every excuse in the world not to go over there. I stared intently at his house across the street, as if noticing it for the first time. I'd almost talked myself out of it when his porch light flicked on. It seemed like an omen, an open invitation from the universe almost. It didn't seem like something I could just ignore. 
So I grabbed his present off the counter and headed over. If one act of kindness could help someone on this damn street have a happy holiday, well, I guess that wasn't so bad. Five minutes of my time wasn't much to bring a smile to someone's face from one lonely car trip to another. Philip opened the door with a surprised look on his face. A drink was swirling in his left hand. And wouldn't you know it, it smelled just like eggnog. I got a little something to go with that. I smiled, holding up the wrapped bottle. He smiled widely as the apprehension melted away from his face. Well, come on in, friend, he exclaimed. The smell of pine and cranberry assaulted my senses when I stepped into the home. Philip had gone all out in decorating, which was strange, considering all the years he'd lived here. I hadn't seen many family or friends stop over. Santa decor was as far as the eye could see. He even had a milk and cookie station set up in the corner of his dingy and cluttered kitchen counter. We sat a spell as we drank and talked. I attempted to forego the eggnog, but he forced his drink into my hand for a taste faster than I could politely protest. My teeth cringed, and my throat heaved at the spiked, creamy concoction. One sip was more than enough for me, so I just told him to give me my booze straight in the glass. Unfortunately, after sitting with him for about 20 minutes, I realized I drank far more alcohol than I'd meant to. Before long, it was time to break the seal. Eh, you know what I'm talking about. When you've been drinking and you take that first piss, it seems like once the first one comes, you can't stop peeing after. I asked him where the bathroom was and excused myself to follow his directions. My feet bumbled and I stumbled down the semi-unfamiliar hallway and I found myself opening the door to a spare bedroom. Instead of a much-needed toilet, I was greeted with a single twin bed, aging furniture, and an old television set. Great. Embarrassment and drunkenness outweighed my curiosity, not to mention my fully engorged bladder. I was just about to close the door when something caught the corner of my eye. An old dresser, oddly placed in the center of a back wall, seemed to be emanating light, which made less than no sense to me. Why would an inanimate object hold any kind of aura? Dread dried my mouth and knotted my stomach as I began moving it away from the wall. I had to take extra care to be as quiet as possible. I was already taking too long, even for a piss, even a drunken one. To my horror, the dresser gave way to show a solid tan door, painted the exact same color as the walls surrounding it. Seeping out from under the door was a highly faint pink light. There was no yellow to it, but I recognized it all the same. It was guarded by two slide locks and a padlock device. I dialed 911 and whispered my location as discreetly as possible. I moved the dresser back and walked into the living room area. I sat right down with that bastard like not a thing was wrong in the world and had me pour another drink. We talked about our favorite Christmas time movies until the police arrived. The look of shock and betrayal on his face as our eyes met when they busted down the door is one I'll never forget. Rhonda Mackenzie shrieked in terror as officers carried her past her abuser, now face down on the ground in handcuffs. It turns out Philip Turner didn't see one day of jail time. His body took the easy way out succumbing to a fatal heart attack in the back of the police cruiser on the way to jail. Little Rhonda is home safe and sound with her parents. Unfortunately, she still hasn't uttered a word since the incident. I tried to give the family their privacy, but we've become a lot closer since finding their daughter. Well, wouldn't you know it. Another year has passed, and it's almost Christmas time again. Philip across the street is still dead and rotting in the ground, and his house has sat empty like a lousy reminder every single day since. You'd think the graffiti and piles of crap spattered on his porch would have detracted anyone from wanting to move into this hell pit. But you'd be wrong. A car pulling a U-Haul storage pod behind it pulled into the house next door before a man got out to unload his belongings into his new home. His aura was 
Vanta Black. We spoke earlier about the not-so-joyous Christmas season. It's the gift of giving and sharing. However, whenever you tell one of your friends or family how you're feeling, you get met with either unadulterated ignorance and pep or annoyance at your mood dampening their holiday spirit. It seems like bad feelings can be contagious like common colds are. If only there were a third party, someone you could talk to, whose job it was to help. Someone you can unburden yourself to without having to worry about watching the weight of your burden sag their shoulders as you hand it over. Well, there is. Better help counselors are the best when it comes to maintaining your mental health professionally, non-judgmentally, and calmly. Whether it's depression, anxiety, relationship issues, grief, or any other problems standing in your way, BetterHelp is the best way to tune up your personal well-being. It's professional therapy done online. Quick, discreet, convenient, and at a price anyone can afford. Here's how it works. Within 48 hours of signing up, you'll be communicating with your own licensed therapist who specializes in your specific needs. You can reach out anytime and receive timely, thoughtful responses. You can schedule weekly phone or video sessions at your convenience. Your personal counselor will always be close at hand. No awkward office visits necessary. It's professional help right in your pocket. And if you ask me, there's no better gift than self-maintenance. Better help isn't a self-help regimen. It's real professional counseling tailored to your needs. It's more affordable than traditional therapy and for those who need it, financial aid is available. Therapy is no longer an indulgence for the rich and famous. Thanks to BetterHelp, therapy is for everyone. Over one million people are using BetterHelp to get a handle on their problems. So many, they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. So why wait, friends? I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash horror. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash horror, H-O-R-R-O-R. -R -R. Thank you for your support and for supporting our valuable sponsors. I hope you enjoyed Blood and Eggnog by author N.M. Brown, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that first tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support her by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash brown. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash b-r-o-w-m. N.M. Brown would love for you to check out her many contributions, both to the world of literature and the Simply Scary podcast community. Blessing or curse? Mm. I, for one, would hope nobody would be peeking at the state of my soul. That's why I subscribe to Soul Lock. Only a small monthly fee, and they call to warn you if somebody's been digging into your aura or not. Worth their every penny, I assure you. Uh, what's that that went by down the street? Oh, what a shame. You know, one of those things about Christmas time is that while most get to spend time with their families, there are those who are always working. Take the ambulance that just drove down the street either out to save someone or pick up somebody that didn't quite make it. Why, up here on the shelf, I actually have a scale model truck, just like the one that drove by. It was a gift from a recent acquaintance of mine. Perhaps you've heard of the manufacturer, Reiki Industries? Just so happens this truck belonged to a young man with some troubling problems, an EMT, 
who looked forward to a Christmas Eve much like tonight, but for very different reasons than the rest of us. Without further ado, I present to you a repeat of a notorious story by author Ron Reiki. Ambulance means walking. Christmas means dead. My very first Halloween, I wasn't on schedule. It was my first year as an EMT. I had a calling to attempt to resurrect the dead for minimum wage. I was interested in the busy shifts, but apparently Halloween is one of those days when everybody wants to work. I don't believe in ghosts, but I do believe in drunk drivers, and if you want to see something really horrifying, you want to have a graveyard semaine shift where after the bars close, everybody starts dying in the most imaginative ways. I don't mean to be gallows, but I wanted to see the worst so I could get hands-on training. The more corpses you get through, the more lives you can save. You only learn by pushing yourself, by working as many Saturdays as you can. If you didn't know, more people die on Saturday than any day of the week. But the one day of the entire year with the most deaths that's Christmas. So I was thrilled when I saw my name listed on the schedule for December 25th. The reason why so many die on Christmas? Well, it's debatable. Some say people hold off their death until Christmas. Others say it's because that's the day of the year where hospitals are the most understaffed. Others say it's because the air is filled with the supernatural. Where you have angels, you have demons. My partner that night was a demon named Arthur, a 30-something-year-old grandfather whose entire identity was in a fantasy of his one day being a doctor. Now he was a lowly EMT. He was always angry, always quiet, always broken by the future. We sat in a parking lot looking at the closed pizza place. It's hemoglobin lettering. I couldn't ask Arthur a question. He'd just reply with a yes or no, or worse, a mere hand gesture. So we sat in L.A.'s desert cold, the engine off. I thought of hemoglobin, thought of blood goblins, of hemogools, of the way that the patient always puts us at risk, not only with their blood, but with their peritoneal fluid, their synovial fluid, amniotic fluid, Pericardial fluid, cerebrospinal fluid. So much fluid that we are really bodies of water. We're talking rain or storm clouds on the horizon. Arthur's snoring felt like fingernails running down a chalkboard. Well, no, like fingernails strolling down a chalkboard taking its time. Brady Pineo. I wondered if Arthur would be the first death of the night. I was trapped in my mind for Christmas. The mess of Christ, that's my life. Being an EMT is a cross between a janitor, a chauffeur, and a very stupid doctor. Being an EMT is a cross. It's a crucifix. No one was dying, or they were dying but alone, safe in hospital rooms with no nurses nearby. The nurses at home playing Santa, playing records, playing solitaire. I thought of the origins of St. Nicholas. On my phone, I did an internet search, finding out that back in the old days, the European hills used to be filled with fires and wheels and set ablaze. Trials were postponed. The criminally guilty would be hung later. They waited for their death throughout Christmas. St. Nick was condemned as a devil in 1680, ruled to be in alignment with Satan the view that he was taking the emphasis away from Christ. I didn't believe in anything except medicine, and even with that, I had my skepticism. My phone died low on battery. The black mirror of sky reflected my insides. We were close to midnight. I went to the back to lie down. The ambulance was the oldest one the company had. The paramedics got the good ambulance. The rite of passage was dealing with broken sphygmomanometers, bent gurneys, panels that refused to slide without force. 
I wondered how many patients had died back here. Years of useless cardiopulmonary resuscitation on corpses, decades of uncontrolled bleeding. The blood must be up to my neck by now. I'm drowning in patients. The panic attack came on quick. It felt like trying to swallow my tongue. Uh, FYI, it's impossible to swallow your own tongue. The foolishness of people who think epileptics might do so. But it felt like that. An inability to breathe, just like the patients, so many who I've had. The nasal cannula that does nothing. The non-rebreather mask that does nothing. The bag valve mask that does nothing. The nothing that seems to help, the relaxation that is death. I don't believe in ghosts. On ghosts, under ghosts, none of that. To be even clearer, I don't believe that you see ghosts. I don't believe ghosts are external. I believe that ghosts are in hearts, they're in lungs. There are cold ghosts of the ossicles and the warm ghosts of chromosomes. When you are truly haunted, the dead are in our blood. I couldn't see any ghosts. You can never see any ghosts. I could feel them. There were footsteps inside me. Wind blasted, a church collapsing internally. Paver nocturnus. Night terrors, but not memory. The now. The New Agers will tell you to be in the now, except now. Not when they, a long list of they, are crawling. It's a long lineage of grandmothers who took last breaths while EMTs rapped along to metal lyrics blurring through static alternating radio stations. I've witnessed so much boredom with the dying. You only put up a dramatic fight if families in the back of the ambulance. Otherwise, you work with the intensity of plumbers. We are librarians for human beings. We sort you to different hospitals and the Dewey Decimal System of the morgue. We do what needs to be done and nothing more. We're legally bound to stay within the confines of our training. We cannot do magic. We watch patients die and take thorough notes of their death. There's no magic in that. But there is voodoo in their return. My skin bubbling. I wish I could tell you the story of my body, but it's private. It's self. It's haunted house. One in five Americans suffer from mental illness. So maybe you know what I'm talking about. When the ghosts are in your attic. When the ghosts are your attic. All the windows are locked. You're having an in-your-body experience. And then it's her. Or him. I couldn't tell the sex. The person we transported who went through the windshield. No seat belt. Landed on the pavement and slid face down the length of a football field. The shirt, the shorts, torn through. The face eradicated. You don't transport a patient like that prone. You put them spine so they're staring at you. Except the eyes were taken by the road. I see a face that's not a face, and that face is in my skull, frontal, cortical, limbic. I can feel myself being suffocated by them. All the patients who took last breaths, and now they want mine. I'm about to die by the hands of the imaginary. I can feel the past tense becoming present. I can feel the gift of strangulation. Hands inside the neck. The radio comes on. Someone's died. Someone has died and saved me. They run. They hide. They return. The back of the ambulance once again smelling like bleach diluted in water. The ambulance looking like a prison cell diluted in hospital. I go back up front, clawing, mostly fully drained. The hollow. The fresh hollow of the living. I take a breath and punch the radio button to take the call. I hope you enjoyed Ambulance Means Walking, Christmas Means Dead, by author Ron Reiki, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed this last story and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscurrypodcast.com slash Reiki. 
That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash R-I-E-K-K-I. It hasn't been all that long since you heard from Ron, so if you'd like to hear more, tune in to our prior episode to hear more about this versatile and prolific writer slash actor and his collected works. And now, a quick break from the horror, as I sit down with something a bit more heartwarming than our last story. It's a tale of a man who wakes to find a stranger with an old sleigh breaking into his house. It doesn't call the cops, but with the jesting out of the way. Brush aside the skull on your end table, grab a glass of something refreshing, and settle in. Without further ado, I present to you A Visit from St. Nicholas, or Twas the Night Before Christmas. Twas the Night Before Christmas by Clement Clark Moore Narrated by Otis Jiry Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas would soon be there. The children were all nestled snug in their beds, while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. And Mama, in her kerchief, and I in my cap, had just settled down for a long winter's nap. When out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from the bed to see what was the matter. Away to the window I flew like a flash, tore open the shutters and threw up the sash. The moon on the breast of the new-fallen snow Give the luster of midday to objects below, when what to my wandering eyes should appear but a miniature sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. With a little old driver so lively and quick, I knew in a moment it must be Saint Nick. More rapid than eagles his coursers they came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Dasher, now Dancer, now Prancer and Vixen, on Comet, on Cupid, on Donner and Blitzen, to the top of the porch, to the top of the wall, now dash away, dash away, dash away all, as dry leaves that before the wild hurricane fly, when they meet with an obstacle, mount to the sky. So up to the housetop the courses they flew, with the sleigh full of toys, and St. Nicholas, too. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof the dancing and pawing of each little hoof. As I drew in my hand and was turning around, down the chimney St. Nicholas came with a bound. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot, and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled! His dimples, how merry! His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry! His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard of his chin was as white as the snow. The stump of a pipe he held tight in his teeth, and the smoke it encircled his head like a wreath. He had a broad face and a little round belly, that shook when he laughed like a ball full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf, and I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. Not spoke a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings, then turned with a jerk and laying his finger aside of his nose and giving a nod up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle, and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him explain, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, 
and to all a good night. Hi, this is Otis Jiry, and in closing, I'd like to wish all my fans and viewers and their families a very Merry Christmas. May your day be joyful and exciting. Bless you all. I hope you enjoyed this rendition of Twas the Night Before Christmas, attributed to Clement C. Moore as performed by yours truly. That poem was originally published anonymously, but as time wears on, there's been some discussion as to who actually authored it. Clement C. Moore, who is one most commonly associated with it, or Major Henry Livingston Jr. Regardless of who wrote it, it remains a timeless, quaint little classic. And as we start to return to the darker side of Christmas, may it lift your spirits just enough that they won't go back down into the ground again anytime soon. As a reminder, if you decide to give any of these talented authors stories a read, please consider leaving them a quality review and a kind word, or a thoughtful public comment and an upvote. And be sure to let them know that you heard about them here on this program and that Otis Jiry sent you. It means more to me than you can imagine, and I'm sure they would very much appreciate it as well. Thanks again for your support of this show and of tonight's featured authors. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark, the final one of Season 9. Man, I can't believe we're going up to Season 10 already. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs, or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky, get some sleep, have a Merry Christmas. Uh, get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>
Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>